we can start. Ladies and gentlemen, good morning. It's a great pleasure for me to welcome you to the Yenai Enrico Mattei Foundation Lecture on Islamism and Modernity, an Unconventional Perspective. First of all, let me, let me thank our lecturer, Tarek Hege, one of the most influential and nonconformist voices of the Middle East intellectual arena. I want to thank also our discussant, Valentina Colombo, fellow professor of culture and geopolitics of the Islamic world and history of Arab thought at the European University of Rome. I want to thank them for accepting our invitation, for finding time for this conference, and finally for helping us address this challenging issue from an unconventional point of view. Secondly, I want to remind you that this Yenai Enrico Mattei Foundation lecture is organized as part of the activities of our Economy and Society Research Program. FIM, Yenai Enrico Mattei Foundation, has been giving great emphasis to this research program with the intention of adding to the study of the social and political dimension of the sustainable dimension to its consolidated technical and academic research on environmental topics. This is why we decided to include the great ongoing geopolitical and economic shifts in our research domain. A specific activity of this program, Economy and Society, aims to constantly monitor the geostrategic development of the Southern Bank of the Mediterranean Sea. First of all, because Italy is geographically surrounded for most part by the Mediterranean Sea, and it can be rightly counted among the so-called Mare Nostrum countries. This means that we must pay particular attention to the cultural and social diversity that characterizes North Africa and the Middle East. Secondly, because we must also consider the long and consolidated economic cooperation between Italy and the Southern Bank of the Mediterranean, and in particular, the strategic role that this area plays in the field of energy exchanges with our country. More so, there is bigger reason why this topic is important. What happens in these countries affects Italy because we share a common destiny. The Barcelona Declaration in 2011 established a global partnership between the European Union and the 12 countries of the Southern Bank of the Mediterranean. This ambitious project must now be revised in the light of the unforeseen social and political events that are taking place in Egypt, Libya, Tunisia, and so on. Will these countries be ruled by an open and like vision of a society or by an Islamic one? What will be the impact of this course of events on migration flows to Italy? The consequences are still unclear, but they will definitely affect Italy. These, among others, are the reason why FIM, the Enai Enrico Mattei Foundation, is following closely the events taking place in an area of geostrategic relevance. In 2013, in July, we hosted the first lecture on this specific topic here in Milano. In that meeting, Zaid Al-Ali, senior advisor on constitutional matters for IDEA, 
which stands for Institute for Democracy and Electoral Assistance, gave us some insight of the recent constitutional process in the Southern Bank of the Mediterranean and on its legal, political and social consequences. He explained how the core of the debate surrounding these dynamics is the quest for a balance between the needs of a like and modern state and the role played by the religious authority in inspiring how the state has to operate. Today, we deliver the second lecture of the cycle, and we offer a cross-cutting overview of the main historic, political, and social dynamics concerning the Islamic world. We desire to shed some light into current drive to reconcile Islamism with modernity, democracy, human rights, and multiculturalism. Which are the consequences of the current renovation processes taking place in North Africa? Which are the prospects in the relationship between Islamism and Europe, between immigration and demographic processes, between cultural diversity and integration. To address such a complex and strategic topics, we have asked Tarek Hegi to give us a lecture and to Valentina Colombo to discuss his lesson. Tarek Hegi is distinguished senior fellow at Gatestone Institute in New York, visiting professor at several world-class University and barrister at law before the Supreme Court of Egypt. He is author of many books in Arabic, English, French, and Italian, and a co founder of the chair of Coptic Studies at the American University in Cairo and of Tarek Hegge's scholarship in Jewish studies at the University of Toronto. Moreover, Tarek Hegi has in his long career held many important positions in business, academic, and civil society sectors. Valentina Colombo teaches culture and geopolitics of the Islamic world and history of Arab thought at the European University of Rome. She is also senior fellow at the European Foundation for Democracy. Her research focuses on democratization processes in the Middle East, with particular regard to Arab liberal intellectuals and the role of women in politics in the Middle East. Before passing the baton, let me thank Giulio Sapelli, who is the coordinator of the Economy and Society research program. I want to thank him for having invited Tarek Hege. I want to thank also Filippo Tessari, Valeria Paponetti, and Valentina Milella for having, for having organized perfectly this lecture. Wishing you a fruitful conference and, and, and a pleasant stay at Yenai and Ricomate Foundation, I give the floor to Tarek Hagi. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, I am honored and pleased to be here addressing this distinguished gathering and addressing this very important and crucial topic. What I aim at today is to share with you the search for three very important questions. 
كان إسلاميستس and I will mention only once that I'm say when I say Islamists I'm talking about political phenomenon I'm not saying Muslims I'm saying Islamists can Islamists live with the modern notion of a state this is a core subject another core subject can Islamists live with the values of modern societies and the third and very important question would Islamists live and coexist with human rights in general and the rights of women and minorities in particular so these are the three domains or the three questions that I would like to share with you and not only talk about them but after I shed some light we engage in a discussion about these three core questions <clears throat> after more than 35 years of studying political Islam Muslim brothers the jihadi movements I came to the conclusion that their main problem is with the notion of modernity and this that what I would like to go in details around it in this speech the notion of political Islam is related to number of stations one of them is the Saudi Wahhabi coalition many people don't understand or, or, or realize that this Saudi dynasty is not the first Saudi dynasty is the third Saudi dynasty the first Saudi dynasty started in 1744 and was ended by the Egyptian army in 1818 the first Saudi dynasty was founded by two gentlemen one of them was named Muhammad ibn Saud and from which the name of the kingdom comes Saudi Arabia and the other fellow Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahhab and from the same from the name the word Wahhabism comes the first Saudi dynasty came to an end in 1818 when the ruler of modern Egypt Muhammad Ali sent the Egyptian army led by his son Ibrahim who ruled Egypt for a very short while in 1848 <coughs> and the clash was very clear cut a clash between Islam as it was in understood by a Bedouin nomadic culture and Islam as it was un understood by a Mediterranean society i.e. Egypt and the main cause of the clash was that the first Saudi dynasty was against music singing and things of the sort and when the Egyptian and the Syrian pilgrims used to sing they were shot at by the local people who belonged to the first Saudi dynasty the second Saudi dynasty was for a short while in the 19th century came to an end in 1891 and then immediately the third dynasty came in 1902 when Abdulaziz ibn Saud who was born in 1875 captured Riyadh and started his march to unify as much as possible of the Arabian Peninsula I always say when I am in Europe the following and I find it very ironic if any one of us goes back in time to the year 1902 and goes to Riyadh and meets with the king he would meet with the king who is the direct father of the king today imagine 1902 and today 2014 we just moved from the father 
to a son, because the king today, whom I have a high, 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 high respect to, is Abdullah ibn Abdul Aziz. And the ruler at the time was Abdul Aziz. So it, it doesn't exist anywhere that after 112 years, you just move from the father to the son. Thanks to the number of the children the father had, 118, 38 boys and 80 girls. And amazingly, the one who taught me who is who among the list is a British, someone with the name Robert Lacey wrote the book, The Kingdom, and he put at the end an annex for the 118 sons and daughters of Abdul Aziz, and he did it in a very scientific way. Who is the full brother of who? <laughs> who is the mother of who? And he did it in a very scientific way. You go to the list and you see number 12 is the full brother of number 25, 37, 48. And the name of the mother and the job and when he was born, and this is by a wonderful author, Robert Lacey, The, the Kingdom, The House of Al Saud. <laughs> so we have this station, which is Arabia. There is another station, which is Egypt. In 1928, a young man at age of 22 with the name Hassan al-Banna founded a society in the city of Ismailia named the Society of the Muslim Brothers. We now know that it was not only a personal initiative. We know that the British Embassy was behind it. We have documents that the British Embassy was financing him through the Suez Canal Company. We also know now that the Saudi king or Sultan at the time, he was called at the time the Sultan of Najd and the King of Hejaz was behind it through an, uh, an intermediate liaisoning person with the name Muhammad Rashid Rida. If we take this date, 1928, and try to understand the environment, we find that it is related to the following. One, in 1923, the end of the Ottoman Empire. Two, 1926, the unification of Hejaz and Najd in what will become later the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. And the third, which is very important for me, the death of Saad Zaghloul, the leader of the national movement of Egypt. The theater looked as such. Somebody said, if the Ottoman Empire has died, we have an alternative. And the alternative is the Muslim Brothers. And the time difference is very short. 1924, Mustafa Kemal Ataturk announced the end of the Ottoman Empire. Only four years, which is in history, is like today, tomorrow. The Muslim Brotherhood, founded by a young boy who was only a facade to those who wanted the, the dream of the caliph system, al Khilafa, to continue. Also, why the British Embassy would finance the Muslim Brotherhood? It is the same phenomenon like why America and Osama bin Laden went together to Afghanistan in 1979. It is this idea that people of this area cannot be controlled except by religion. This is a very deep idea in the secret services in places like England and America, that you can't control these people except by religion. And amazingly, in the year 1901, there were two secret of British secret offices of different views. The MI6 office in Cairo thought that you can unify the people of this area under the word Arabia. But there was another office in Delhi, in India, that thought you cannot unify these people by culture. You can only unify them by Islam. And actually, the British government did not buy any of the two. They allowed both of them to fight each other. <clears throat> and when the ruler of Hejaz, al-Sharif Hussein, was supported by Lawrence of Arabia, this is the idea of the language, the culture. The king of Najd, 
عبد العزيز ابن سعود was supported by جون فيلبي also from the same organization but فيلبي thought that you cannot unify these people except by the name of Allah this is the only secret you can use actually the two fought each other and the one who prevailed was the one from the east the one was supported by the Philby and it's amazing that Philby when you when you read about him he very much believed in Abdul Aziz and though he was at the end a British spy but he lived it completely in the system he lived he, he, he married to four women he lived in a tent he lived as if he was a Bedouin himself and just to make you laugh about it his son was also a spy but in Moscow Kim Philby is the most famous spy of the one of the most famous spies of the 20th century was his direct son John Philby in Riyadh Kim Philby in Moscow so this is the stage of political Islam an attempt to say after the death of the Ottoman Empire that no, the project is still alive. We can carry on with our project. So does it move? For some reasons, it didn't move. Okay. Oh, the, the lower one. I am the worst with equipment. I rely on children and grandchildren. We leave the politics a bit and talk about the mind, the culture. Islam goes back to the early 7th century. It came from the basic Arabia. It stayed very basic for a century. But as of the 8th century, Muslims found themselves ruling a great part of the old world, from Spain to the borders of China. Totally different, totally culturally different. With the Abbasid rulers in Baghdad, a movement of translating ancient Greek masterpieces was launched. This activated the cultural life of the Muslims, but one should remember it was very selective. While they translated some of Aristotle, Homer, Homer didn't appeal to them. The whole Greek theater didn't ap appeal to the Arabs. So while we have some of Aristotle writings translated into Arabic, we never had a play by Eschylus or Euripides or Sophocles translated into Arabic for obvious reasons. They were not interested in this multi-god culture. They translated scientific works in areas of chemistry, mathematics, physics, and some philosophical wor works, especially Aristotle. This initiated a war between two schools of thinking that are still going on until this moment. A school of thinking that says, we as Muslims have to be totally governed by the script. And the other school says, either by the script and the mind, like Avacina, or only by the mind, like Averus. <laughs> to the extent that Averus said, when there is a clash between the script and the mind, we go with the mind. And we say we must have misunderstood the script. This battle that amazingly Valentina knows about it more than any one of us here in the room because she wrote a book about Al Mu'tazila that were the front runners for this school of thinking here. This battle is still going on until today when you have a very moderate Muslim, whether he knows or not, he goes a bit closer to the mind than the script. And when you have a very strict Muslim, he goes closer to the script rather than the mind. And you have all the colors in between. 
90% mind, 10% script, 90% script, 10% mind. But this has been the main conflict of the Muslim mind since the beginning of the first exposure to the others. The others, very important word for nomadic people in Arabia, because others are in general, for a nomadic person in Arabia, are enemies. People are coming to take your water or to take your women. And they, they have been these two cores of the relationship with others. In the ninth century, there was an Abbasid uh, Amir or a ruler who sided with the mind. His name is Al Ma'mun. And he was actually very ruthless with the other school as well. Only a few years afterwards, one of his brothers, Al Mu'tasim, sided with the script. And he was equally ruthless, killing Al Mu'tazila in the streets of Damascus for giving the priority to the mind, even partially. This battle is represented by the literature of two great names, Al-Ghazali, Al-Ghazal, and Ibn Rushd, which is in Latin, Averos. Al-Ghazal or Al-Ghazali made it very clear. There is no reason to anything but the will of God. And he said in his famous book, al Munqidh Min Al-Dalal, and now I need Valentina to translate because impossible for me to translate it to Italian. What would be al Munqidh Min Al-Dalal? The savior from... Exactly, heresy. Yes, yes, exactly. Heresy is in Arabic because I see Arabic eyes here. <laughs> These are, for me, I, am, I have no doubt. I have... Uh, Ayun Arabiya, there is no doubt about it. <laughs> I wouldn't make the mistake, yeah? One, two, three, four, five, six line. Sixth line, yeah. Yeah. Uh, are you astonished? <laughs> How come? Al Ghazal said, if I have a cotton, piece of cotton in my left hand, and I have a fire in my right hand, and get them close to each other and ignite the cotton, the fire is not the reason of the fire. It is the will of God. So the reason, which I, 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 I love the fact that in European languages, reason means also the, the mind, yeah? But in Arabic, al-aql, the mind, has nothing to do with the reason. It is with breaking. Al-aql means ya'qil, to break like the break of the car, yeah? So the origin of the word mind in Arabic comes from stopping you, while in Latin languages coming from having a cause, a reason. If something has a reason, it is reasonable. <coughs> On the other side, Averroes, who was the great translator of Aristotle, and Europe knew Aristotle via him first, before finding the, the original writings of Aristotle, was on the other side completely, that the mind, that the script cannot be in contradiction with the mind. And if there is a contradiction with the mind, it is our own fault, and we follow the mind until we understand the script correctly. But to tell you the end of Averroes, he was in exile in Marrakesh. He lived originally in Cordoba. He was kicked out by politics, went to Marrakesh, when he died, he founded one person to walk in his funeral. And this man was a very famous man, Muhyiddin ibn Arabi, because I see also here Orientalist eyes. There are here Arabian eyes and here Orientalist. I can see the Orientalist eye here. Actually, when he died, there was only one man who dared to walk in his funeral, Muhyiddin ibn Arabi. And Muhyiddin ibn Arabi in the old muse, muse in Arabic, al-Hawari, you know, an old muse of Marrakesh did the following tragic scene. He got a donkey, he put the body to the right side, and the books of Averroes to the left side, and then he walked behind the donkey, and this was the miserable funeral 
of the man that was rejected by the Muslim world because he gave priority to the reason and the mind. From the 12th century, the Muslim societies followed the script school and abandoned the mind. And we don't, we, no wonder why these were the centuries of stagnation. From the 12th century until the 19th century, the contribution of the Muslims to the march of mankind became very small until the clash happened again in 1798, 1798, with Napoleon coming to Egypt with a printing machine and making Muslims to think again why we are that backward. And the question has been in the air for 200 years. Why we didn't do well? Why, after doing well for a short while, we declined, and then we lost, and then we were even occupied by the other side of the Mediterranean. And when it comes to contribution to the march of science, we made some contributions in the 9th, 10th, and 11th century. Avacina book about medicine was the main reference for many years. It was called Al-Qanun, which Al-Qanun means in Arabic the law, but it is originally a Greek word. Canon is a stick. In, in ancient Greek, yeah? so and because a law needs a, a stick behind it. Without the stick, there is no law, the enforcement. Since Napoleon came to Egypt, people are in this debate. People say, we did not do well because of this battle between the script and the mind. And one of those who believed in this was Muhammad Ali, the founder of modern Egypt. Because the first thing he did was to send Egyptians for education in Europe. Every five years, there was a, another group of Egyptians coming at the beginning to Italy, actually, and then afterwards to, to France to study things like irrigation, like engineering, and many things. But did we leave the conflict? No, the, we, ne we ne neither left it and the conflict ne never left us. We have been with this school of two, two schools of thinking. While Egyptians like Taha Hussein said, we are more of a Mediterranean people in Egypt. And we should look, I remember very well this from his book, Mustaqbal al-Thaqafa fi Masr, Future of Culture in Egypt. We have to look northwest, means Europe. There were Egyptians like Hassan al-Banna saying, no, we are not doing well because we didn't look southeast. If we look southeast, we would be what we used to be in the 9th and 10th century. The Muslim brothers are deeply involved in this. They say that we have an alternative to the Western civilization, a complete, cohesive, integrated alternative to the Western civilization. We have a constitutional alternative, political alternative, economic alternative, banking system, everything. But there were the other school of Taha Hussein and many others, Tawfiq al-Hakim, Nagib Mahfouz, who believed that Islam is a religion and we have full respect to as a religion. But it is not an alternative to what human being achieved in many other domains. So, two very important stations that happened. A fellow with the name Abu A'la Maududi in India made many Muslims. Today, the Muslims of India are split between two groups. The ones who went to Pakistan, about 150 million, and the ones who didn't go to Pakistan, another 150 million. So the ones who went to Pakistan, which became afterwards Pakistan and Bangladesh, were influenced by an author who was, I wouldn't say a copy of Sayyid Qutb, Sayyid Qutb was a copy of him, who said that Muslims should not live in a society ruled by non-Muslims. You as a Muslim should always live 
under a Muslim government. And this was what was taken politically by Muhammad Ali Jinnah, Muhammad Ali Jinnah, the founder of Pakistan. And if we compare today the situation of the Muslims, it's amazing that half of the population is still in India, half is in Pakistan. But if we compare, I have a book focusing on the comparison between the Muslims who stayed behind and the ones who went to Pakistan. These ones have democracy. These ones do not have democracy. These ones have scientific advancement. These ones live on the scientific advancement of the others. These ones didn't have a single coup d'etat. These ones had six coup d'etat. These ones did not produce terrorism. These ones are the main contributor to terrorism. But they are the same Muslims. Both are Muslims here. But what is the difference? It is the formula. In India, you could be a head of state while you are a Muslim from the 15% population, which happened only a few years ago. You can be a Sikh, which is 2% of the population, and you are a prime minister as it is today. Because of this oxygen of freedom, you don't need to go and kill people and explode yourself. Abu al-A'la al-Mawdudi affected very much an Egyptian with the name Sayyid Qutb, born 1906 and died 1966. Sayyid Qutb was originally a poet who wrote, who was a literary critique until 1949. 1949, he went to America on a Fulbright scholarship. And he came back as a different person. He came back with the following ideas. The West is our enemy. We can't live together with them. We have to establish an entirely Islamic environment. We have our political system. We have our legal system. We have, and those who rule us with non-Islamic terms of references, are infidels. And he even described the Egyptian society as a society of infidels because they go to non-Islamic terms of references. Sayyid Qutb wrote many books, but the most important one of them, a very concise book of 90 pages, Ma'alim ala tariq Signs on the Road, in which he said, you either leave the society, i.e. Egypt, or you fight it. If you stay, you have to fight it until it is converted into a Muslim society. The man was taken to jail and capital punishment in 1966, but his ideas are still living today. And actually, the group of people who ruled Egypt for one year from mid-2012 uh, to mid-2013, were the followers of Sayyid Qutb. From 9-11, the West started a new stage in dealing with Islamism. 9-11 was a big insultation, a big humiliation, a big hit to the number one Western country. I know for sure that from 2001 to 2011, people in America, and when I say in America, America is different than any other country. The word America is a very big thing. The administration, the CIA, the Pentagon, the think tanks, the universities, all of these bodies were busy thinking of how America should react to what happened. Should America fight Islamism, or should America try to contain and accommodate Islamism? I know for sure from going to Washington DC and New York more than 40 times, speaking at most of the think tanks, that the choice was accommodate, not confront. Slowly, the idea was matured or cooked. We talk to these people, they talk to these people, they discover quickly that all what they want is to rule their societies. So the idea came, let us also 
help them to rule their societies. But meanwhile, they give us guarantees about terrorism in the West and also give us some guarantees about Israel in particular. And I'm, I wasn't astonished when the Muslim brothers came to power in Egypt on the 1st of July 2012 and in December, the same year, less than six months, an agreement was formulated and signed between Hamas and Israel and guaranteed by the Muslim Brothers of Egypt. As if the Muslim Brothers of Egypt wanted to say to America, rest assured, we will focus on ruling our societies, but we will not do two things. We will not repeat 9-11 and we will not launch attacks on Israel. Actually, the agreement between Hamas and Israel in December 2012 was an amazing agreement. It didn't only talk about no military attack, but also no media attack even. And by doing this agreement in December 2012, some people in America must have said to themselves, okay, we, we have done very well. We exported the snake to the Muslims. Instead of having the snakes with us, we exported the snake to the Muslim societies. So instead of fighting, I'm not, again, not fighting Islam, fighting Islamism, and instead of fighting Islamism, send it, ship it to their society. And you know that most of the leaders were in London, for instance. And you, you do have also here in this country many of them. Actually, today, which is amazing, there are Italians, not Italian immigrants, Italian, pure Italians, who converted into Islam and fighting in Syria. And this tells you, even if we are talking about four or five or six people, but it tells you that when we come to the point of, did, Islam, did Islamists give up the use of violence? It's, it's, it's another complexity. So, what is called the Arab Spring is much deeper than what people think. If we take it naively and utopi in a utopian way and say, the Arabs just got up all together in 50 days. They were asleep for 1,000 years and then got up in December 2010 in Tunisia and then started to get up quickly in Egypt, in Yemen, in Syria, in Libya, it's just against all logics, yeah? I mean, it happened actually in less than 100 days. We know now that people were trained in Serbia how to do these things, how to communicate, how to mobilize people, how to get people in, in the main squares for a long period. So is it a conspiracy? No. It is an outcome of autocracy. When the autocrats fell, these people were ready to jump on the seats. But they were helped also to do this. I cannot buy it that we, became, we, we continue apathy, negative for decades, and in 100 days, we all become revolutionists. It's just against logic, yeah? And then what proves that it's against logic is who benefited from the Arab Spring. In Tunisia, it's the Muslim Brothers under different name, Nahda, yeah? In Libya, actually, there, there is no state now in Libya. It's, it is moving very rapidly towards anarchy and chaos. And people even stop oil production and oil exports until they get their cut. Yemen is on its way to complete division. Syria, I say, although Bashar al-Assad is not good news, but is the alternative a better news? Is the Nusra that love to have photos with heads of people cut. Most of the photos have people carrying the heads that were cut of the Syrian army or the photo that 
many of you must have seen of one of the jihadists opening the chest of a Syrian officer and chewing his heart. Is this is the alternative we, we, need, we, we need to choose from? I was in a conference in uh, Russia with my dear friend like six months ago, and President Putin gave us the honor of coming for one day. And in a few words discussion with him, I said, if Russia wants to play a role, it must not accept this choice, either Assad or Nusra. It should say, no, there is a third way. We might reject Al-Assad, but, but we have to reject also the alternative and, and promote an alternative that keeps Syria as a modern state, as a modern society. Because if Syria collapses as a modern society, S Syria, Iraq, and Egypt are the three cornerstones, in a way, of the Middle East. Of course, Saudi Arabia is a very important place, but culturally, these are the three cornerstones, and Iraq is, is, is down the drain, yeah? I mean, America went to Iraq to do what? To deliver Iraq to Iran? Is this a good result? Is to get a prime minister that gets order from Tehran? <laughs> is to have, to cement the division of Iraq? I, I, I went to, to Kurdistan. I will go for, if I am a Kurdi, I would say, I, I better go alone on my own. Why should I be with, with these people? I mean, my people do not kill, do not explode. They focus on, on, on life. And I remember when I arrived to Erbil, I was there for a few hours to meet with the prime minister. The minute the door of the plane was opened and I saw the guards, girls, unveiled with a machine gun, I said to the prime minister, I, I got the message, you are telling me we are better than the Arabs. And this is the message that, that the bodyguards are girls. Yeah, and it, it must have been a message, yeah? why the three bodyguards were girls, modern girls, in a uniform with a machine gun, yeah? And again, we look at the Middle East today. There was a plan worked out by the International Organization of the Muslim Brotherhood and many players, including America, including Turkey, including Qatar. And I was very also uh, astonished when Putin mentioned in, in, in Russia. We were not in Moscow, we were in the north, nearby Lithuania, I guess. Uh, when he said, when I, when I asked him, what do you think Qatar is in the boat of the Muslim brothers? He said, of course, to replace the Russian gas. Qatar is the only country that can provide Europe with the same volume of natural gas that comes from Russia. So if you can do this to Russian gas and get the Qatari gas to Syria, but in order to do this, you have to finish the regime in Syria first because the regime in Syria is very close to the Russians. So you finish the regime in Syria, you get the friends of the West, being America, take the gas line from Qatar to Syria, liquefy the gas, LNG to Europe, and then say to the Russians, enjoy your gas, sniff it, smell it. What do you do with all of this gas? And then you have no income, so you are again in, in, in 1989 environment. In 1989, the oil prices were down, which helped the collapse of the Soviet Union. The Soviet Union would have survived with a hundred dollar a barrel oil price, at least for a while, because it had its own decay. It was inside the system. The decay of the Soviet Union was a self-decay. It was not from outside. But the price of oil in 1989 was $8 per barrel. So Russia was made to be poor. Actually, the Saudis helped a great deal. I read a PhD thesis on this particular topic. The favor that was made by the Saudis to the Americans is to produce more oil, as my great friend said it yesterday. Go to 12 million barrels instead of 8 million barrels. Once you do this, the oil price will go down, Russians will be bankrupt. And this is what happened. A very similar plan is today 
on the stage. If you want to weaken this wild Russian beer, Putin, yeah, let him lose oil and gas prices. And with good income, Putin is capable of saying to America, no, in many areas. In Syria, in Crimea, and we look at the map. What did the Arab Spring produce? Iraq was before the Arab Spring, but it's in a mess. Every day we have five to ten people killed is average in Iraq. Car explosions is like sunset and sunrise every day. Syria is a hell of an inferno by Dante's terminology. It's a real, Syria, the beautiful country, is, is a true inferno. Yemen, one would have imagined that there is anything, nothing worse than, poorer than Yemen, but the conflict will make Yemen even worse. Egypt, which would have been the prize, was rescued from the path. Egypt would have been the real jewel, the prize, that the Muslim brothers rule Egypt, control the streets of Egypt, and help us to play the new map of the new Middle East. Tunisia is very important for me, but not for the rest of the world. For me, why I say very important? Because it was the most advanced society with regard to values, like uh, others, Jews, Christians. They don't have Christians, they have Jews in, in, in Tunisia. Uh, women, I mean, the best status of women in the Arab world was in Tunisia. It is the only country that dared to say polygamy is against the law. You can't marry two wives. You don't divorce your wife. You both go to the court and get a set. The, the, the judge is the one who divorces you. It's not the man who cancels the contract. But for me, I'm, I'm crying on Tunisia because for me it was my dream to see the Arab world following the path of Tunisia. But at the end, what will happen in Egypt is what will color the whole region. When Muhammad Ali made Egyptians to love Europe, the entire region looked to the northeast and started to get education in Europe and love the progress achieved by the West. When Gamal Abdel Nasser made the Egyptians raise the flags of socialism and pan-Arabism, the area followed Gamal Abdel Nasser. When Sadat said, enough is enough for fighting, let us now talk to our enemy, everybody cursed him, but everybody is doing today what Sadat wanted to do. Everybody, I mean, including Hamas. Hamas that said once, the only difference between us and Fatah, that they want to reach Palestine through negotiations and we want to reach Palestine through, through the Kalashnikov, is now on an agree signed agreement with Israel of no mutual attack. <coughs> so we move to a very important point. Do we have differences between the Muslim brothers and the other wings and waves? You have names like jihadist, Al-Qaeda, Al-Nusra, Daesh, Hamas, in my views, there are lots of tactical differences, but strategically, not really. One would like to kill you quietly, and after he kisses you, and one will chop your neck. <laughs> but at the end, both of them want two things. Uh, an Islamic government called Al Khilafa, the Caliph, and both of them would like to apply the Sharia law instead of the modern laws. Today, today, literally, there is a meeting in Gaza 
for the implementation of the physical punishments, cutting hands and legs and slashing and whipping people today. They are studying today a project of a new law of physical punishments. So of all of them would like at the end to reach these two stations, I shouldn't pay attention to different tactics. When people say, Hassan al-Banna, what is the difference between Hassan al-Banna and Sayyid Qulb? Hassan al-Banna said, we will take people to these two stations by a da'wah, preaching. Sayyid Qutb said, no, by jihad. But at the end, we will reach these two stations. The Muslims of Egypt, Syria, Iraq, and Turkey of the 50s never found that there was a conflict between modernity and religion. I was raised in this environment where people had Islam only as a religion. Islam, sorry for the simplification, for the bedroom only. You pray in your room. But when you go outside your home, you deal with life with different tools. What are these tools? Science, scientific tools. I saw that when somebody says it's not doable. But we saw that in the 40s and the 50s and the, and the 60s. When Lebanon, Syria, Iraq, Iraq was a, was a true secular society. Today, the word secular is a dirty word in our societies. You can't use it. And we keep going around the world by saying civil society in order that we don't use the word secular because the word secular sounds like atheist. And I, I'm not aware of any secular writer like me who said that secularism means segregation of religion and life. We don't say that. We say segregation of state and religion. It's a totally different story. We are not saying take religion out of our life. I, we, nobody says that. It, it's not the case here. It's not the case in America. The whole thing is the state. The state has no religion. The state is an arbitrator, neutral arbitrator between us. The terms and references are laws. The state, when, when, the, when the Egyptian constitution says, al Islam deen al dawla Islam is the religion of the state. It makes me, as someone who studied law, laugh. What does it mean? Because the first lesson I studied in the first year at the School of Law, 1967, was that we have two types of persona. Natural persona, us, and moral persona, like companies and institutions. When you say to me that moral institutions have religion, it makes me to laugh. Because it means that Egypt would pray and fast. Egyptians would pray and fast, but Egypt cannot pray and fast. So when we say religion is, uh, Islam is the religion of the state, it's, it's a sheer mistake. Islam is the religion of the majority of Egyptians. It's a different story. But saying that it is the religion of the state, it's a joke. Because at the end, it doesn't work. When I pick a subject to discuss with Islamists, I take this one, freedom of belief. In a modern society, you have to accept the freedom of speech. Give me one example of an Islamist, not a Muslim, an Islamist who would accept the following. A Muslim woman marrying a non-Muslim man. No way. A Muslim who said, I'm fed up of all religion. I don't want to remain as a Muslim. Oh, we have a very small prison for you. We cut your throat only, nothing else. <laughs> we will sort it in a few minutes. <laughs> so freedom of belief, while the Muslim brothers, when they came to power in Egypt, the first thing they discussed was no way to have a woman as a head of the state, no way to have a non-Muslim as a head of the state. So what are you talking about? We have also to be practical and look at Syria and Iraq. When people say, a Muslim government, we say, okay, show us where it works. Somalia, Afghanistan, Sudan, Syria, Lebanon, is this is what you want to take us to? If you have another example that never existed in life, we will tell you, though, you have a good example on paper. But where on earth? You have a society with 
religious terms of references that has progress, freedom, prosperity, women. The Islamist uh, in Egypt have, uh, they repeat an amazing statement by Sayyid Qub. The nation is a rotten term. This is Sayyid Qub. So for him, the word Egypt is a rotten word. Why? Because it stops the dream of Al Ummah Al Islamiyah, the Muslim nation. So when we, when people were blaming Morsi when he was president of Egypt, why did you accept to negotiate with the Palestinians, giving them part of Sinai and part of Egypt to Sudan? The answer was it doesn't matter. They are Muslims. So they can eat the same cake. So the whole thing is the notion of a state is not there. The, they don't have the notion of state. They have the notion of the Muslim Ummah, the Muslim nation. But a modern state with a legal system, with individual freedoms, with freedom of speech and freedom of faith, it doesn't exist. And simply for them, I mean, I, I used to ask Islamists, is a Christian Lebanese closer to me culturally or an Indonesian Muslim? The answer is immediately Indonesian Muslim. But no, he's not. His culture is different. And the, and the Christian Lebanese is much closer to me culturally. And we, we share more domains than the Muslim from uh, Bangladesh or from Indonesia. But it is, it's a political project. This is the whole thing. We are not talking religion. We are talking a political project. A project to rule the Muslims by one imam leader in accordance to the Sharia. We have also to look into the Hamas ex experiment in Gaza. They came to power by elections. Few years afterwards, they split from the main body. And they even killed their enemies. And then they said, we are not leaving. We will stay forever. So what about rotation of power? You talk about being democratized. But rotation of power is part of the game. Would Hamas accept rotation of power? Of course not. When Morsi was doing TV debates before he was elected, he was asked like 10 times, if the other person running against you, Ahmed Shafiq, wins, would you accept this? He used to say, it will never happen. Not, not yes or no. The answer was, it will never happen. Is this is a joke? No, it's not a joke. And Islamist believes that he and God are together. If I am sided by God, it, it makes me think totally different. I'm correct, you are wrong. I'm always correct, you are always wrong. I can even do nasty things to you because you are on the wrong side. I think Hamas experiment is extremely important. Does Europe have a problem? I'm sure it does. In 2010, and I participated in producing a documentary film about the Muslim Brothers to the Norwegian TV Channel 2, which I think Valentina has watched it, because we did it in about 20 languages. We were lucky to interview the number one fellow in the Muslim Brothers in an institution or organization in Egypt at the time, Mahdi Akif. When he was asked, would Europe become Islamist? He said, of course, no doubt. He said, when? He said, shortly. He said, just take a pen and compare your demographic growth to our demographic growth. You produce one child maximum. We produce seven to 10. <laughs> so if you make some calculations <laughs> at the end, we will be the majority in Sweden. And actually, he had years. He said, in this year, we will be 51 in Sweden. In this year, we'll be 51. And even if it takes 100 years, he said, but it will come. Any people 
who grow at the rate of 3% per annum versus those who are minus, like in Germany, the end result is known. So is Europe related to what, to what we are discussing? Of course it is related. Is it because of Muslims? No, because of Islamists, not because of Muslims. Muslims who come to Europe and accept the rules of the game, things like democracy, human rights, women's rights, accountability. There's no problem with do they have the right to go and pray on Friday? Of course they have the right. But once they start saying that the formula has to be changed, they are Islamists, they are not Muslims. And do, do some people say this? Absolutely. Today, Valentina showed me a reaction to what happened in Britain a few hours ago. In Britain, the Prime Minister formed a committee to investigate whether some British people were killed in Egypt by Islamists or not. And at the end, it might lead to consider the Muslim Brothers as, as, as terrorist group in England. The immediate reaction of the Muslim Brothers in Europe is, we come to Europe to abide by the rule. We tell them, you are the best in talking. But let us examine this in reality. Do you really come to Europe to abide by the rule? Are you sure of this? So why you produced more than 500 Europeans fighting now in Syria? I'm talk not talking about immigrants, pure Europeans who converted into Islam and understood it this way, that in order to be a good Muslim, you take the clashing cough and go and fight for the jihad. So the criteria in Europe should be that Europe is a large pot. People are allowed to come without any agenda to crack the value system that is the base of the European civilization. But once you talk, as people do in England, where I live partially, we need polygamy to be legalized in England. We need to apply Sharia law in, in England. Once you have this, you are in danger because you have somebody trying to pull you back to the darkness of the Middle Ages. I think we covered this. About to be okay. Can the Muslim brothers moderate? The answer is if they accept number of premises. If they accept, for instance, that a woman could be the head of the state, a Christian in Egypt could be the head of the state, a Copt is a full citizen, the cops have the right to establish churches as the Muslims have the right to establish mosques. We have many points for them to answer this. Did this happen when they were ruling Egypt? No. Let us see what they discussed in the first meeting of the Islamist party. To reduce the age of marriage for girls to nine years old. You told me, Valentina, that it's happening somewhere else in Iraq? In Iraq. In Iraq, yeah. The Shia is this is the, the real problem of Egypt? Is this is what we have to work on? Or to create jobs, to improve education, and to improve living conditions? Is our first priority to go backward to the seventh century and allow men to marry girls at the age of nine? And isn't this a sort of uh, a type of psychological problem in the West? If a man wants to marry a girl, at the age of nine, it is even have a name, yeah? It has a name, yeah? That it is a sort of uh, psychological deformation, yeah? But this was discussed in the first session of the Islamist parliament in Egypt. They would immediately go to the following. Alcohol in tourist, uh, touristic uh, resource, uh, churches, women. We, we know exactly what what they are concerned with. So when an American 
congressman says to me, the Muslim brothers have moderated. And I ask him, give me the evidence. And then he says in a complete American naiveness, they came here and told us that they have improved. Oh, wallahi. Yeah, that's very nice. <laughs> they came here and did swear that they changed their views about women, about Christians, about Jews. Yeah. And they came here and said it by themselves. Wonderful. Typical naiveness, yeah? I think the best thing is there is one, yes. I always put this before the eyes of any Islamist that I talk with. I say, let us talk about few values. Let us talk about modern state, pluralism, other right of the other, women's status, relativity, are things relative or, or absolute, violence. I like what uh, Valentina always says when you ask an Islamist, is violence allowed? He say, no, but. The most important thing is the but. <laughs> no, violence is not, not allowed, but. We need to define violence. And then the definition of violence will take many forms of violence outside the picture. Yeah. Violence, until this moment of time, I am not aware of one Muslim society that agreed to a Western definition of violence. Because for them, if you say, you go to a restaurant in Tel Aviv and you kill civilians, is this a terrorist or not? You have immediately two different views. In the West, it's, it's terrorist. For them, no, no. But then we say, but these are civilians. They say, but the end, they, they serve every year, one month in the army. So they are part of the army. So they will, we will, they will not fail to find an excuse. They have actually a jurisprudence, fiqh, that justifies killing innocent people. They have this, they have a fatwa, that if I go to kill a police officer, and coincidentally, I kill civilians, they have a justification for this. That number one, you helped him to go quickly to paradise. That's number one. So you give him a quick visa, yeah? Then, again, and your intention was a good intention. And at the end, even the one that was killed, he didn't lose much. He, he got a shortcut. <laughs> and you know, of course, that paradise for them means one thing. Yeah? Do you know what is this one thing? Yeah? I heard you. <laughs> paradise means mainly women, yeah? I mean, the, the whole thing is related to this. I mean, and I remember, uh, th this is a true story. A few months ago, an imam in a small village in Saudi Arabia was preaching the following, totally against the majority of the imams. He said, this is all rubbish. You don't have women in paradise. Actually, you don't have desire. You don't have a desire to have a woman. And then he went even farther and he said, there will be no sexual organs. And then somebody stood and he said, you go to hell. I have been controlling my life for 20 years. And now you come and tell me that there will be no organs upstairs. I mean, I am living on the, on the dream that there will be. <laughs> and now you come and tell me there will be no sexual drive, no women, no sex. But I am controlling my life entirely. Because of this target. Why didn't you tell me from the beginning? So I would have selected a different path in life. I would have immigrated to Italy, for instance. <laughs> so the whole thing is we have a movement that is purely political, but is using religious viciously to control people. I like a few words that Machiavelli once said to his custodian, Lorenzo Medici, when somebody talks to you politically and brings the word religion into the discussion, remember, he wants to control you. 
it is it is the it is the tool for control. Yeah. We have a movement that claims that they matured and became a copy of, for instance, the Christian Democratic Party in Germany, and we say no, not yet. If you say that Islam is the source of your values, we have no problem. But this is not what you are saying. You are saying to us, I have a different package, a totally different package, constitutionally, politically, economically, culturally, for everything. And we look into it and say, you call it Islamic, it is medieval. It's Qurun Wusta, this is the whole thing, yeah? You call it Islamic because this is the way you will sell it to people. How would you sell your package if you don't label it with religion? I mean, I always take Israel as an example and say, the true founder of Israel, most of them were atheists. Ben Gurion was an atheist. But the religious card was very instrumental. How would I move 20 Russian farmers from Siberia to the Middle East at the age of 40 and tell them you will speak a different language tomorrow and you will live in a different environment without a carrot? And the carrot is religion. Without religion, I mean, that's why the project of Israel didn't work when people said Argentina. At the there were people saying Argentina and there were people saying South Africa. But the, the, the logic was people will not come to these places because the religious linkage is not there. If you want to move simple Polish Jews to the Middle East, the, emo the, the religious emotion is very important. And I honestly have nothing against the project. I only say that religion is a political card. And Karl Marx might have been mistaken in a number of things, but not in all of things. His, his characterization to religion, in my view, is very correct. It's a tool that could be politically used very powerfully and forcefully. It doesn't mean that religion is bad by definition. This doesn't mean this. It means that it could be hijacked. It could be taken over. It could be utilized. Because it's very effective. If I stand and talk to people, poor, very poor people in Upper Egypt, who never saw a girl until they were 15 years old, about paradise as characterized by a Salafi, and I tell him that it cannot be the case they will listen to him. He has more cards in his hand. He satisfies them much more than me saying to them rubbish things like, maybe there's no paradise in the first place, but if there is one, it will be a moral thing more than a physical thing. No, this is not what he wants to hear. He wants to hear the other stuff, his living conditions. And, what, and that's why I believe that the Muslim brothers in Egypt understood the society more than the opposite, the, the other side of the equation. They worked very hard in small villages. They always, I mean, why when I go to any Egyptian village, I find next to the uh, mosque two things, a school and clinic. They are serving people, educating their, they are not, I don't mean school, they, they, they have classes, evening classes. So we help your children to be well educated or better educated, and if your wife needs treatment, especially during pregnancy, we have a clinic. They are doing what the government should have done. And actually, I, th I think that because of the failure of the governments in the Middle East, the Muslim Brothers built a shadow government that does appeal to people more than the government. And then you go to an ignorant person and tell him the Muslim brothers are bad people. He say, the Muslim brothers, they, they treat my wife and they educate my children. How could they be? So in the first place, as I said, the autocrats fell. The ones who were ready to take over are those ones. Because the autocrats killed all other alternatives. All the non-Islamic opposition were terminated and as... I don't remember the name of, I think Afif Akhdar said once, that's a Tunisian thinker. In the Muslim societies, we have two powers. Autocrat above the ground and Muslim under the ground. 
So when the autocrat is removed from the subsurface, the only available and ready one is the Islamist. But is he going to do a good job? Far from. But he is ready to take over because he has been working on it for decades. Anyhow, I suggest we break now. We go to discussion, and in between this and the discussion, we, you might have a summary of what I said miraculously in five minutes, miraculously, the Mu'agiza. Her, her Arabic is better than most of you, by the way. Yeah. yeah. She, her grammar is, is amazing, yeah? But she studied only Arabic. <laughs> okay, I thank you very much for listening to me, and I wish you all the best. And let me now, let me now do this, because my grandson will ask me, did you use what I gave you? Yes, I did. At the end, <laughs> this was given to me by my grandson, and he said, you have to use it. So I used it. <laughs> thank you very much, Tarek. We are late, but that we didn't want to stop you because uh, you gave us a I great... I wasn't boring, yeah? No. Okay. <laughs> you gave us a great uh, historical and current overview of the Islamic world. So, thank you very much. Now I give the floor to Valentina. Mm -hmm. And you. Uh, you have time to do what we are expected. Okay, so I go ahead with the summary. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Right. Come ha detto il professor Heggy, di fatto devo fare un miracolo perché un'ora di sua lecture da ridurre in, in cinque minuti in italiano non è affatto semplice, anche perché sono stati, è stata un'ora abbondante di, di contenuti, un, un condensato. Io credo che eh, forse la cosa più importante è a questo punto in italiano focalizzare quello che è stato il nocciolo eh, della questione. Eh, il, Tarek Eghe ha iniziato appunto con eh, tre eh, domande, tre interrogativi che riguardano, ribadisco, gli estremisti islamici e lui ha voluto sottolineare eh, ed è un qualcosa che io eh, condivido eh, che lui sta parlando, si sta riferendo non a musulmani, ai musulmani in generale, ma semplicemente agli islamisti, agli estremisti islamici. Per cui il suo è un discorso ben preciso rivolto a, ad uno spicchio del mondo islamico, ma non ovviamente al mondo islamico stesso di cui lui fa, eh, fa parte. Quindi i tre interrogativi con cui eh, ha esordito eh, Tarek Eghi riguardano appunto il rapporto tra l'estremismo islamico e il concetto di Stato, la società moderna e i diritti umani. In poche parole il rapporto, come dice il titolo eh, appunto del, dell'incontro di oggi, tra estremismo islamico e modernità. E la, il fatto in, importante e interessante è che eh, Tarek Eghi ha sottolineato che il, il rapporto, il problema eh, tra, che si pone, che si è sempre posto, ed è questo è un qualcosa di veramente importante da ricordare, cioè questo, il, il rapporto tra estremismo islamico eh, slash eh, conservatori, eh, persone in seno al mondo islamico legate al testo, e la modernità, quindi oggi, e eh, pensatori come Tarek Eghi stesso, eh, definiti liberali, eh, pensatori che, nei quali prevale la ragione, e di fatto sempre esistito. Quindi non è una novità di oggi, è un qualcosa che sin dal, possiamo dire, dall'ottavo secolo, noi troviamo in seno alle società islamiche. Quindi ovviamente lui è partito da eh, due personaggi chiave in seno a quello che è il dibattito teologico nel mondo islamico, ha citato due nomi che a chi si occupa di Islam e, e non solo eh, sono molto familiari, al Ghazali, rappresentante di quello che è la scrittura, la 
dominanza della scrittura rispetto alla ragione e dall'altra parte un personaggio come Averroè, che tutti noi eh, conosciamo, nel quale prevaleva la ragione in nome di un, come dice uno dei testi fondamentali di eh, Averroè, un, un bilanciamento tra fede e ragione, cioè laddove la fede viene spiegata dalla ragione, ragione che conferma la fede, quindi non la esclude. Accennato poi ovviamente a quello che è il periodo che viene definito nella storia del, del pensiero arabo-islamico, eh, il periodo di immobilismo che va dal XII al XIX secolo, cioè un periodo in cui praticamente non, non c'è più eh, riflessione, eh, c'è sem semplicemente rielaborazione di quanto era accaduto nel passato, sino al 1798, momento in cui con lo sbarco di Napoleone in Egitto si ha lo shock, si ha nuovamente lo scontro in questo caso tra mondo islamico e, e occidente. A quel punto si sì, riscatenano nuovamente le tendenze iniziali, cioè chi era contro l'assimilazione totale dell'Occidente, chi era totalmente a favore e poi, questa è una cosa che, eh, cui si è accennato di meno, comunque è sempre esistita anche una via di mezzo, una via di mezzo in cui si diceva possiamo prendere dal, dall'Occidente quello che ci può portare verso la, la modernità senza però venire meno la nostra islamicità. Ovviamente corro perché <ride> tutto questo lo ritroviamo eh, ancora oggi, lo ritroviamo l'altro momento di shock eh, che ha sottolineato il eh, professor Eghi, eh, che è stato un momento di shock eh, sia per l'Occidente che per il mondo islamico, di fatto è stato l'11 settembre, 11 settembre in cui tutti più o meno ci siamo chiesti, eh, eh, prima fra tutti, eh, uno storico dell'Islam, Bernard Lewis, eh, che ha scritto proprio un libro, What Went Wrong, che cosa è andato storto, quindi ma che cosa è andato storto in Occidente, che cosa è andato storto poi anche dall'altra parte, no? perché da una religione siamo passati poi dall'Islam, siamo passati all'estremismo islamico. Poi ovviamente il, il passaggio successivo è, è una riflessione su la cosiddetta primavera araba, momento in cui eh, si ha la primavera eh, inizialmente dei fratelli musulmani, la loro eh, ascesa al potere e poi ovviamente con l'avvallo dell'Occidente, con l'avvallo per ragioni di politica interna, di sicurezza interna, per ragioni anche eh, legate al, al commercio, legate anche all'energia, l'accenno all'alternativa all eh, del gas del Qatar rispetto al, al gas eh, russo, insomma sono tutte questioni che ovviamente hanno avuto un gioco eh, in, in tutto questo. Da quel momento eh, parte la eh, definizione da parte occidentale, da parte della stampa occidentale dei fratelli musulmani come moderati, estremisti moderati, questo ossimoro eh, che per chi appunto come eh, il professor Eghi conosce eh, tutto quello che ci sta dietro eh, insomma, eh, non torna. Ecco. Tutto questo ovviamente ci porta, eh, ha sostenuto il, il professor Eghi, a domandarci se in seno all'estremismo islamico esistano delle sfumature, quindi esistono gli estremisti islamici moderati oppure no? La risposta è stata esistono delle tattiche diverse, esistono delle tattiche diverse per cui i fratelli musulmani risultano tra virgolette moderati perché sono più pragmatici, quindi tendono ad ottenere 
il risultato che è lo stesso diciamo, dei salafiti, dei jihadisti, ma appunto con metodi diversi, il risultato finale è quello di giungere ad un califfato islamico, ad, un, ad una diffusione alla umma, ricreare questa ideale quanto fantomatica umma eh, islamica, ma attenzione, dice il professor Eggi, si tratta semplicemente di diversità di metodi. Il fine è lo stesso, quindi non illudiamoci. Quello che è anche interessante, e così chiudo il, il riassunto eh, in italiano, io credo che sia stato lo schema, lo schema finale, eh, nel momento in cui il professor Eggi ha messo a confronto la modernità e l'estremismo islamico su alcune voci. Ha parlato di Stato moderno, di pluralismo, dell'altro, della condizione della donna, quindi dei diritti della donna, relativismo, la violenza, l'umanità e l'universalità della conoscenza e del sapere. È evidente, ha detto il professor Eggi, che siamo di fronte a due visioni completamente diverse. E sono due visioni completamente diverse perché da un lato eh, abbiamo i diritti la vita, lo Stato concepiti partendo dal, dall'Islam, dal diritto islamico e dall'altra abbiamo dei diritti concepiti come universali, distaccati da una qualsiasi forma di, eh, di religione, ma basati su quella che possiamo definire un'etica, una morale eh, universale. L'altro aspetto interessante eh, che vorrei eh, ricordare, qualora fosse su, um, sfuggito a qualcuno, è proprio quello che ha sottolineato verso la fine il professor Eggi, le dire attenzione, noi che siamo a favore della modernità in questo mondo, ovvero noi liberali, noi laici, talvolta siamo definiti e percepiti come atei. Ecco, e questo non è vero, e questo non è vero perché non significa che noi non siamo musulmani, ma significa semplicemente che nella nostra vita la religione è un fatto personale, mentre quello che è lo Stato, i diritti e la legge si fondano su altro, specialmente oggi nel XXI secolo. E Importante, credo, nell'elenco eh, di prima è la questione del relativismo, perché credo che poi eh, riguardi proprio e marchi proprio la, la differenza tra le due posizioni. Cioè, il professore ha ribadito che quando si parla in ambito di estremismo islamico, si tratti dei fratelli musulmani o si tratti del, diciamo, dell'estrema destra eh, islamica, il problema è sempre il ma, no? Eh, quindi esistono dei diritti della donna fino al momento in cui questi diritti della donna, è solo un esempio questo ma eh, può essere eh, allargato a, a tante altre tematiche, fino a quando i diritti della donna non superano i limiti posti da Dio, posti da Allah. Quindi anche la sacralità della vita diventa sacra sino a quando non supera i limiti posti da Dio. Quindi nel momento l'esempio che, eh, che portava il professore alla fine è proprio quello per esempio dell'attentato suicida per cui nel momento in cui io, estremista islamico, dico dopo l'11 settembre sono state tantissime le dichiarazioni dopo l'11 settembre che hanno detto siamo contro ecco, il terrorismo però c'è sempre un ma, se si tratta di un attentato suicida in Israele, allora è resistenza, quindi va bene, è accettabile, o perlomeno è giustificabile. Ecco, io credo che il succo del discorso eh, del, del professore sia, sia questo, ecco, sia eh, il messaggio sia stato proprio quello di eh, non sfociare mai nella troppa tolleranza nei confronti degli estremisti islamici e neanche però di arrivare dall'opposto, cioè quando eh, il professore diceva eh, 
i, i musulmani hanno il diritto di pregare, certo hanno il diritto di pregare, perché no, hanno il diritto ad una moschea, sì hanno il diritto ad una moschea, però eh, attenzione a chi questa moschea va in mano, ecco, perché si potrebbe ritorcere contro i musulmani stessi. Ecco, eh, e quindi io credo, chiudo qua la, la parte di, di riassunto una speranza di aver concentrato in una pillola di 5 minuti o, o meno un, un discorso che è ovviamente è molto più profondo, che però so verrà appunto poi eh, stampato, distribuito nel, nella sua totalità, perché eh, merita veramente di diventare una, una fonte di, di informazione e di, eh, e di riflessione. Ok, so I switch to English. Ok. <laughs> I switched to English, and as far as the discussion is concerned, I would like to start with Tarek Hegg's words. You have in your hands, I think, uh, a book, a leaflet by, uh, by Professor Hegge. And at the end, there is a sentence, which is a paragraph, which is very, I think, uh, interesting to what has been told today. Although I deplore and condemn all the legal measures taken by the Egyptian, Egyptian authorities against the Muslim brothers from 1948 up to their accession to power, I'm entitled to ask what proof we have that the trend of Hassan al-Banna, who advocated accession to power by peaceful means, is today the only trend within the society of the Muslim Brothers. And what proof is there that the trend which uh, opted for forceful reform, that is, through the use of violence and bloodshed, has disappeared? Or, for that matter, what proof is there that the accession to power of the peaceful trend within the movement will not be followed by a takeover by the non peaceful trend which will refuse to step down as Hamas has done in Gaza under the pretext that the only they are qualified to apply God's law. I think this is very, uh, very important. And we go back to all the uh, wonderful speech uh, by Professor Hege. I think that the key to understand uh, what he has been saying is a, a reflection about the concept of moderation. Is there a moderate Muslim Brotherhood? The answer in an article published in 2007 uh, in, in the American magazine Foreign Affairs was yes. And the authors of the articles two jo American journalists, uh, Laken and Brooke, said what Professor Hege said, that they went to some uh, MB leaders and asked them, are you moderate? Is there uh, a moderate branch of the Muslim Brotherhood? And of course, they answered yes. And they wrote an article about the moderate Muslim Brotherhood. But in the same year, always in the state, Newsweek published an article, it was a um, very uh, well uh, promoted and widespread, whose title was even worse. Is there a radical moderate Islam? And the reference was to Taliban's. And the article was by uh, Farid Zakaria, uh, editor-in-chief of Newsweek uh, magazine. And the idea in the beginning of the article was, are there any moderate Taliban's? And the answer was yes. I said, wow, yes. I said, yes, because, you know, before Taliban's were waging war against states, and now they don't. So they have become moderate. So please ask them, ask, ask this to, uh, Afghani women. So I think they think it in a very different way. So the term, the term moderation is very important. What 
do we mean with moderation? We mean something different. What does the Muslim Brotherhood, for instance, and all the Islamists mean with the use of moderation? Moderation is a, a very important word uh, for the Muslim Brotherhood. But moderation doesn't necessarily mean being quiet, being not violent. It depends. It depends. It means moderation in getting the result, in reaching the objective. This is their moderation. So, as uh, Professor Hege uh, explained uh, in a perfect way before, if some Islamists say just, okay, I cut your throat, the Muslim Brotherhood, I say, no, just wait, I'm not cutting your throat, I'm cutting your tongue. Okay. So, and I think that the, the best definition of the Muslim Brotherhood has been given by a Tunisian uh, thinker, uh, an academic, Mohammed Haddad, and his definition of Muslim Brotherhood was not moderate Islamists, but pragmatic Islamists. And there is a difference. I want to go back to that word, unconventional. Why Tarek Egg's view is unconventional? Because he is free of stereotypes, because his mind is, and I think he'll, he'll understand my, what I'm referring to, is an unbound mind. Tarek Egg wrote uh, a wonderful book, I translated some parts of the book into Italian, the title was Prisons of the Arab Mind. And the prisons are prisons made of a wrong education, um, they are the fruit of a wrong system of education and instructions, of wrong curricula, of wrong methods. Well, Tarek Egi is totally different. I remember the first time I, I met him uh, and we spent some hours, uh, as we usually do, uh, talking about our background. And what I found out is that Tarek Egi read in Arabic all Western philosophers or Western literature. But my astonishment was about where and when he read the books. Because I was totally convinced that he was reading them in English or in French. I said, no, I, I, I've read them in Arabic, in an Arabic translation. And when he was young, this happened in Egypt, in his country. But now it's very difficult to find translations of the same books in Arabic. And this is the reason why we have a Tarek Hagi not reaching the majority of Egyptians. You know, uh, uh, in yesterday uh, we were debating the way uh, liberals like him are uh, working now. Of course, internet I is fantastic because now there are websites totally devoted to liberal thinkers and they can reach, they, they break the borders. So they reach, uh, he, he's living in Egypt, between Egypt and the UK, but he's reaching Tunisians and he's reaching uh, Syrians, Lebanese and whatever. So it's fantastic. But, but, they just after a few days after the the fall of Mubarak in Egypt, Time magazine wrote an article, published an article, and the core of the article was 
the MB are the best Democrats at all, while the liberals are the losers and the worst Democrats at all. Why? Because the MB, of course, they knew perfectly well how to use democracy. But the other, I think, uh, important thing is what Professor Heggie said. The Muslim Brotherhood worked very well for decades on the grassroots level. They, while Mubarak was there, there were lacks, there were problems in the educational system, in the economical system. It wasn't so, uh, so good, the situation for Egyptian society. Well, where the, the government didn't reach the people, the Muslim brothers did. So that's why they were the winners. They were helped from the outside for security reasons, internal reasons, and whatever. But especially in Egypt, they had been working for decades preparing this. So people, when it came to vote, of course they voted the people they knew. Even though the majority of Egyptians didn't go to vote. So this is another important question. And I think that now the, the, the future of countries like Egypt in particular, but of the Islamic world in general, is education, is working at grassroots level. And a, a good result of this, a confirmation of what I've just said, comes again from Egypt. In the last month, after uh, Morsi's uh, removal, we had a new constitution, which is a, a wonderful constitution. Is of course, is ink on paper. It has to be uh, implemented, but on paper, it is really great. Uh, the preamble is a, a resume of the uh, history of Egypt. Also, the Virgin Mary is mentioned. And there is an article 11 where women are said to be equal to men. In the same article, they say it's we are against violence in the family. So there are some steps forward. But two events that almost nobody noticed uh, in the Western press are two other events in Egypt. Last December, there were the elections inside the doctors' trade union in Egypt. The doctors' trade union usually belonged to the MB. The head of the trade union of doctors had been belonging to the MB for 28 years. Mm? There were elections and the winner was a woman, but not only a woman, a Coptic woman, Mona Mina. Some months ago, again, elections inside one of the uh, most important parties in Egypt, Adustur. The leader uh, the part is the party of uh, Mohammed Baradei. Okay? And now the leader of the party, again, is a Coptic woman. But both women have in common one thing. They both had grassroots associations. So they earned the victory on the ground. And I think this should be the model for Egypt, Egyptian government, and in general for other Islamic uh, countries. So you have to think about 
the people, not about power, but I think it's the problem of politics in general. Uh, it's not only a problem of Islamic countries, it's also a, a problem of Italy uh, as well. Uh, another, just to, to end, is something that hasn't been mentioned, but I think it should. When Professor Hagi uh, told about the end of Averroe, Ibn Rushd, he told you, uh, of course, that it wasn't such a happy end. Uh, it wasn't uh, such a happy end for him, for his books. So he was attacked. And I advise you to, uh, there is a wonderful movie, The Destiny, and by Yusuf Shaheen, he is an Egyptian uh, director. It has been translated also uh, into Italian, Il Destino. And it tells the story of Averroe ibn Rushd and his fight against, uh, and better, the fight of radical Muslims against him. Mm? But this kind of paradigm that is, free thinkers attacked, condemned to death, persecuted, belongs to the present as well. Yesterday evening, uh, while we were talking with Professor Hege, we mentioned and we passed through the books by an Egyptian liberal thinker, intellectual, Farag Foda. And Farag Foda was a, a prophet we we decided yesterday because it was really right. He was writing at the end of the 80s uh, and at the beginning of the 90s about Islamism. And, you know, if you have a look at what is happening now, uh, he was really a prophet. And in 90, uh, 1992, he was killed by Islamists. He was defined an apostate even though he never said, I'm not a Muslim, okay, just for his ideas. Uh, and he was killed. So, being a free thinker, being a, a liberal today in the Arab world is not so easy. I, for us, it, it's a pleasure to listen to Tarek Egi's words, uh, but it's not so easy being like this is not so easy as far as his background is concerned, as I told you before, but it's not so easy because your life sometimes is in danger. Because there are people belonging to Islamism saying, okay, you are an apostate, you are an enemy of God, and you have to be killed. So, and this is, was simply the end of people like Farah Foda. It was the, not the end uh, because he wasn't killed, but he was condemned as an apostate by uh, a civil Egyptian court of Nasser Hamid Abu Zaid, a wonderful theologian, a Muslim, a practicing Muslim. But the only thing, uh, his mistake was just saying, okay, we have to apply reason to, uh, to the interpretation of the sacred test. Very simple uh, quote, very simple affirmation, but very dangerous for the people who don't want people to think. Because the first thing uh, uh, Islamists uh, teach young people is al fikru haram, thinking is forbidden, but forbidden by God. So this is why people like Tarek Hagi and other thinkers is not alone. There's something, Egypt is moving really foremost because uh, in its uh, uh, DNA, they have wonderful uh, uh, minds and uh, a, a rational path uh, inside them. But I think that the West should decide now on which side to say. Do you want to say on the Islamist side? On the side of people saying, okay, I am uh, against terrorism, but uh, I am I'm not against cops, but they cannot be 
the president. I am for, I'm respecting women, but they are not equal to men, they are just complementary to men. Or you want to say on the ma majority uh, side, and of course, not uh, in, the, in the Islamic world, in the Arab world, the, the, uh, one of the major problems is illiteracy. So, of course, people like uh, Professor Hege are, you know, the, the top, the cream of this kind of society, but they, they reason and they think the way we think. So, and it's, it should be very easy. It should be very easy. <laughs> on what side uh, we have to, to stay, but it's not. So I, I think it's very important today to, to decide that rights are for everybody, otherwise they are not rights. And I, I really do thank Tarek Hege for being here. I really do thank Tarek Hege for what he writes every day. It never stops, it keeps on writing, it keeps on fighting, and I really thank this foundation for inviting him. I was really shocked when uh, Professor Hege told me uh, I'm coming to Milan uh, to give a lecture, because it, it's just like a dream coming true. So uh, thank you so much, and uh, I leave the floor to Q&A that I think would be very, very interesting with Professor Hege. Thank you. Thank you to you, Professor Colombo, for, for your really interesting discussion and summary of the Tarek uh, Hege lecture. I think that there are many questions, so, and we can spend uh, 15 minutes uh, for question and answer session. If someone wants to start, please. I wonder whether this is a question or just an observation. When I was um, 17, in 1956, I went to France to improve my French in summer. And um, I decided to study Arabic. And a young um, Egyptian student was my teacher. But he had no experience in teaching his own language. And probably uh, he wanted, I don't know, to humiliate me in asking me to write in Arabic 3,578,000 22, uh, comma 20 in Arabic, not in figures, of course, which would be done in one minute. So um, after a while, I decided that it was useless to study a language of a people that was exactly like me, whose thoughts I couldn't understand perfectly. In 1956, at La Maison des étudiants in Grenoble, there were students from all former French colonies, and many came from their colonies, still colonies. So, starting from um, Maghreb, um, Morocco, Algeria, Tunisia, Syria, Lebanon, Egypt, um, which were not French colonies, but, and, uh, <laughs> yes, and um, many, uh, the majority were male students, but there were girls also. Many girls, for example, from Iran. And um, what I remember of those years, because every year I went abroad uh, in France or in England, and uh, I had met and I had made so many fr uh, friends uh, whose mother tongue was Arabic that I continued to do so, although I started studying Chinese because of the, they were a little more different from the Mediterraneans. But I never thought for one minute that these people came from 
from uh, Islamic country or Muslim country. Uh, and I would not define the country from which I, I came as a Christian country. These people were Mediterraneans. They were people exactly like me in everything. A, 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 a movement of an eye, of the mouth, was understandable. So uh, to, um, I increasingly became furious with people saying the southern part of the Mediterranean, the northern part of the Mediterranean, North Africa. Well, uh, it, is, it is time to stop to define Africa, Asia, and Europe. Huh? Where's, where ends Europe for me? Where the Mediterranean ends, with the Alps. And what is called the European civilization, a more vaguely Western civilization, is simply the Mediterranean civilization, which includes Mesopotamia, of course. So why, this is my question, why, why were people coming, having a different religious background? In our discussions, there were some Israeli young men who, uh, mixed together with, with, uh, with us, with us all, without any problem, because the problems of the states were not the problems of the ind individuals. This was very clear to us all, and we, we discussed freely everything. So why, after some decades, things became completely different? I still go in those countries. When I got married 45 years ago, my wife and I, we were together since it was our honeymoon uh, journey. Well, this is not exceptional, as you know. But we went to Lebanon, Syria, and Jordan. This was our place because after a while I would go to Japan for some years so I decided to know a little bit more some other parts of the of my home that was Mediterranean but how come and this is my question how come that religion has become so important before you try to answer this difficult question I must say that I I noticed that in the Christian world, some fundamental Christianism was coming up. And I noticed when I went to the United States that Christian fundamentalism was widespread. I wonder whether the reaction of the Muslim world or the, the intolerance that exists in the Indian subcontinent vis-a-vis -vis the religious facts is not a new fact. It doesn't like Napoleon goes to Egypt and, and, and the Muslims suddenly realize that they are backward. No, uh, I, I don't think so. And I would never define Egypt as, the, as an Islamic country. Sorry to have been so long. Uh, do you, we collect eh, buongiorno, eh, io sono Sabrina Cottone del giornale. Eh, ho colto nella traduzione che ha fatto la mh, professoressa Colombo eh, questo allarme per attenzione a chi questa moschea va in mano perché si potrebbe eh, ritorcere contro i musulmani stessi. Ehm, no, volevo capire qualche cosa in più se, se in effetti, eh, visto che a Milano si dibatte questo, questo tema, eh, se il professor Eghi poteva eh, magari approfondire questa, questo timore. Ecco. Mm. Thank you. Uh, for Professor Heggie, uh, yes, thank you. 
uh, I would like to know your opinion about uh, uh, the coup d'etat or in uh, Egypt against Morsi and the violence uh, that follows. Yeah, your opinion uh, about the coup d'etat against Morsi in Egypt uh, and the violence uh, that follows. Thank you. Uh, volevo commentare solo due cose. Uh, Valentina, la <coughs> dottoressa Valentina ha detto che eh, va bene. Eh, parlo in italiano o in inglese? Uh, you said that uh, all right for the women's rights as long as it is not against God's words. In fact, he didn't say that, but he said, uh, yes, this is yours, as long as it is not against our understanding of God's words, because they mix the two things together, no? Uh, th this is the one point. The other point, uh, I was very happy to hear about the new constitution, but remember that this is not the best. Eh? The word secular, of course, of course, of course. The secular state was removed, okay? And another point which is very important, that during the last 30 years or 40 years in Egypt and in many other countries, also the government was using the religion. Huh? And in fact, the Muslim brothers were participating in the government without any responsibility, you know, in the power. So, thank you. Sorry, sorry, let me, let me try the stress test. Can we assume that Egypt is not ready for democracy? Because this is the question that I'm asked by my students, so I'd like to hear your answer, if you don't mind. Good morning, thank you for your lecture. I wanted to ask your opinion about um, what's the role of uh, religious education in the acceptance or uh, in the rejection of uh, Islamist groups in countries involved in the Arab Spring, for instance, in Egypt? Thank you. I once put on uh, my Facebook a pic number of photos, the same place, the same. You know, amazing that you have it. You can move them. <laughs> yeah. Cairo University, Faculty of Arts, English Department in 1960, 70, 90, 2000, 2010. And the photos tell, yeah, and, and the photos tell an amazing story. I personally thought before that changes as such take centuries, but they didn't take centuries. You look at the photo of Cairo University in 1960, and you can't tell, is it Rome or Paris? The girls are modern. The girls are mixed with boys in the picture. And then you go to actually 60, 70, they are the same. In 1980, you start seeing changes. 1990, the girls are in the to the back, the back row. Yeah. And, the, and, and, and one would have imagined that these things take centuries. They don't take centuries. You talked about people were looking and behaving similarly. Yeah, but if, if the same is repeated today, they will not be the same. There will be lots of discussion about the food, whether it has pork or not, and, and about the alcohol, and, 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 and it's, it's amazing. The change was very rapid. I think that humanity has failed to create a citizen of the world. So globalization was materialistic only, but was not cultural. So you talk about globalization, 
and you can give me 100 evidences, but they were all material. You tell me that uh, this product, this is made in Korea, this is made in Japan, and the ink is from China. But uh, this is all related to the hardware of civilization. It's not related to the software. The software of civilization is related to culture. So I think that humanity did not address this uh, adequately. That the progress that was made over three decades is mainly on the materialistic side. <coughs> there is a lot of failure on the cultural side. Uh, I'm writing now a book about the Jews of Egypt because the Jewish community of Egypt was an amazing community. It had all the sects represented. We had Ashkenazim, Sephardim, and Karaites. Very few countries had, especially the Karaites. I don't know whether you know what, the, the Karaite group is Jews who believe in the first five books of the Testament only, and they don't believe in the Mishnah and Gemara, which is the Talmud. And I'm mainly delayed writing because of the third group, because they were 100% Egyptians, even the names. The Ashkenazim were called, I, I, some of them are my friends until this moment of time in New York. One of them is called Jean-Marc Oppenheim. This doesn't sound Egyptian, yeah? But, but the Karayat will be called Abdel Wahid Sayyid Yaqub. <laughs> and this is a Jew from the Karayat group. But I believe that humanity has failed in, 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 in producing a citizen of the world. There are few around, but not much. I also accept what you said fully, that people believe that a society like the American society is secular, but when they go and live there and find that some political views are based completely on religious grounds, and you will be astonished that some political views are just based on a text. And so this is one. Uh, it's a very important thing. The problem in Europe is not with the mosques, it's with the preachers. And the problem has never been with the, with the building. <laughs> the building itself is, is, is not a source of any problem, but the problem is, I mean, I personally admire what the Saudis are doing now towards the Muslim brothers, but it's a new step. They did the opposite for many years. It's an amazing step forward that they are even ahead of Egypt in condemning the Muslim brothers. But historically, this was not the case. Historically, Islam that did expand all over the world was more of a Saudi version than anything else. They were the only ones who were capable of building mosques. And then when you build the mosque, you still have to bring about a preacher and you pay his salary. And you will not bring someone who would say something against your, your message. Coup d'etat. I want to have a coup d'etat against you for that. <laughs> this is a very important subject, extremely important, because I believe that one of the weak points of Western world is to bring about a term and take it outside the environment and apply it on something different. What happened in Egypt was not a coup d'etat, but it's my duty to prove to you this, not only by shouting as some people in our region do, but by logic. You tell me, why did, didn't you impeach him as Americans impeached Nixon? I say to you, there was no parliament in Egypt at the time. There was Majlis Shura, which was partially appointed by the Muslim brothers. But the two houses of the parliament, one of them was not there. The main one, the legislative one, was not there. Number two, people said to Morsi in June 2012, you have three things to choose one of them, to resign, to ask for a referendum about you or to call for an earlier election. And he turned the three down. So I don't have a parliament. 
The man doesn't want to do any of the three things. And you ask me to do what? Wait for another three years to complete the term and do what they were calling it, Akhwanat Masr, radicalization of Egypt. The more we stayed, the more the place... I'm not saying this because I'm an Egyptian. I think Egypt is the heart of this part of the world. And not because of anything but culture. Not because Egyptians are better race. They are not. But because of Taha Hussein, Tawfiq al-Hakim, Nagib Mahfuz, Umm Kalthum, the songs, the music, the theater, the whole, the Egyptian role is a cultural role. It's nothing else. I say in Egypt that Umm Kalthum proves, I don't know from where you are, but what is between us is cultural. It is that you listen to the same songs we listen to. So Gamal Abd al-Nasir doesn't prove that there is something between us like Umm Kalthum. Umm Kalthum proves it more. That we have a common ground through art than through politics. We have a common ground through literature. We read Nazar Qabbani, for instance. Apart from whether you are an Egyptian or not, you would like his poetry. So the link between us is not a political link. It's a literary link. It's a cultural link. And actually, it's amazing that the Arab, I wouldn't like to say Qawmil Arabiya, the Arab nationalism, but the whole notion of the Arab culture was born in Syria and Lebanon by Christians, not by Muslims. And remember the names, Al-Bustani, Michel Aflaq. Why? They were Christians who wanted to say to the, to the Ottoman, we are first-class citizens, not because of religion, but because of our tongue. We speak Arabic. Yeah? So the movement, when it started in Lebanon and Syria, it was driven by Christians. But it was taken over by Islamists later. And today, nobody talks about al umma al arabiya People say in Arabic, al umma al-Islamiyya wal arabiya It's always there is wow, and. And the, and the locomotive is the religious one. So if you take a term like inqilab, coup d'etat, and apply it in Egypt, I have the right to say, put yourself in my shoes. I had 30 million Egyptians in the streets saying enough is enough for Morsi. And Morsi refused three propositions that I mentioned to you. What do we do? Assume that what happened on the 30th of June happened, but what happened on the 3rd of July didn't happen, which is the army siding with people. Egypt would have had a civil war. And actually, the Muslim brothers would have won the civil war. They are much better in killing and, and, and fighting. They, are, they have the training and the motive. They are much better killers, we, we have to admit. They are fighters. They're actually the only ones on earth today who put the value of death ahead of the value of life. There is no other culture that put it that way. They are the only ones who value death. All humanity does value life. And they value death. And I heard many, many people in the south of Lebanon saying that they chose to join Hezbollah at the time, this 15 years ago, because if they live longer, they commit more sins. If they live shorter and disappear early, they have a shortcut. So back to your question. The president doesn't want to have a referendum, doesn't want to have an early election, doesn't want to resign, and, he, and we don't have an elected parliament, and they are armed people, what do we do? What do we do except that we fight in the streets? The army of Egypt is not the army of a family like in Syria. Not, like, not the army of Gaddafi. It's a great chunk or part of the society. And this part of the society, half a million people, sided with people. And I only ask people, okay, the army take it outside the equation. What do we do? We are now on the 30th of June. We told him, resign, early election, 
or referendum and he said no so do we what do we do we stay we stay with what what he himself called it akhwanat masr i have no other translation but ikhwanization of egypt i.e radicalization of egypt i don't have another terminology yeah Uh, Muhammad Badia, the head of the organization, was asked when they were ruling Egypt, is Egypt already an ikhwani, means radicalized? He said, no, no, no. Not before all the ministers, the ambassadors, the heads of all organizations believe in our literature. And then we talk about, we talk about pluralism. W w where shall you have pluralism with somebody who thinks that way? I, I really would love to tackle this topic of the crisis of terminology. Bring a term from culture, apply it on another culture. Especially that the other culture is much older. When an American person in particular teaches me on a number of things, I feel like laughing until I die. Huh? Why? Because somebody with 200 years will be very difficult for him to understand a culture of 7,000 years. It's very difficult. <coughs> the new constitution, I'm, I, I saw what you wanted to say in your eyes and I agree to all what you wanted to say. This constitution is not the best, but it puts Egypt on the path of a civil state. And the other one, two years, it put Egypt on the path of a theocratic Egypt. But I guess I'm one of the very few Egyptians who appeared on the TV and said, I'm very angry of Article 2. But very few people, I'm practical. I say, even if I go to Tahrir Square today, I say, I'm against Article 2, I will not have more than 400 people with me. I hope you agree to this. Yeah. So we want the best. But the best is, is not syllable now. Is not syllable, like the one I was mocking on. Islamic, uh, Islam is the religion of Egypt. I, I find it a joke. Islam is the religion of most of the Egyptians. It's a different story, yeah? But as you also said, religion was used by the pre-Muslim brothers all the time. Somebody talked about education in uh, Islamic edu uh, religious education. I have an article that I would be happy to send it to you called Islamic education in Egypt. Do you know that in Egypt, 20% of the students go to an Islamic type of education. Every five students, one of them goes to an Islamic education. So all in all, we have about 20 million students in schools and universities, 4 million in uh, Islamic st schools, university, what have you. Would anybody here believe that the number of students at Al-Azhar University is 470,000 students? Do we need 470,000 students at Al-Azhar University? You need, why do you have a university that teaches medicine only for Muslims? Why don't you call it anything else? Call it uh, Al-Gamaliya University and let them teach engineering and medicine, but why, why do you have an univers Islamic university that teaches pharmaceutical, medical, and engineering studies only for Muslims? And although I'm from a Muslim family, I wrote, if I were a Christian, I would have said, you take taxes from me, and you go and build a school only for, Christ for Muslims. Why, why the hell you do that? And then you take money from me tax, you build mosques, and then Christians build ch churches only from their own money. <laughs> and even when they come to build churches by their own money, we tell them no. <laughs> we, we, we don't a, a, agree. I think the subject of education is extremely complicated. I did some exploration. Egypt didn't have enough financial resources to have schools everywhere. Imagine a small village far away from Mansoura and in a very remote area and people won't need a school. The government doesn't have money. A rich Arabic country comes and says, we are ready to build for you a school, providing that you call it Al-Madrasa al islamiyah the Islamic school. 
and you give it an Islamic flavor, 20% of the educational machine was built by non-Egyptian money that was ideologically directed. These people, if they liked us, they would have given us money to build modern schools, but this was not the target. I would be very happy to send you this paper, but I conclude with a story. I met the Prime Minister of uh, Kurdistan like three, four years ago. He told me the following story. He said that he became Prime Minister the day America imposed the no-fly zone on Kurdistan. So Saddam Hussein was unable to have his planes hitting Kurdistan. He said, the first decision I took was to stop religious schools. All the schools have to be secular, all the universities and so on. He said, the same day of taking this decision, I got a telephone call from the crown prince of a certain Arab countries, offering me lots of financial aid for Kurdistan and concluding the discussion by asking me or begging me to cancel my decision of canceling Islamic schools. So we have, we have a dilemma in our area. We have a problem that some of us made it bigger and we made the problem much huger. Why do we have four million people in Islamic schools in Egypt? If you say we need good preachers, so you talk quality, you're not talking numbers. Make very good Islamic education, modern education. Is it by chance that the heads of Al-Azhar, the good ones are the only ones who studied in France? When we go back and t check who are the good sheikhs of Al-Azhar are the ones who went to Europe because they made the equilibrium between today and yesterday. This is the whole thing, what you take from yesterday and what you take from today. Egypt is not ready for democracy. The last one, yeah. Uh, I prefer to break it down to smaller volume of words because this is, these are big words. Yeah? If I'm an Egyptian today and you ask me what your priorities are, I will say to you security, economy, democracy, but I will not make it the other way around. I will say security, I tell you one thing, I spent half of the year in London, half of the year in Egypt. I never had the habit of asking my family members every day, did you come back to home except in the last three years? Every day I check whether my daughters came back, grandson came back. It means that we have a security problem. Everybody is checking with his family. Did you come back? A concern that we did not have it before to check that everybody is back, why? Because as you follow in the news, we have violence. And you refer to violence that started after. But when a girl was killed a few days ago, only because she was wearing a cross, is it very difficult to know who killed her? I think we know that we have violence, but it's also very clear who is behind the violence. It's very clear. Those, I, I, I carved the following word for them. I'll say it in Arabic and then translate it into English. I said the Ikhwan have the following slogan without they say it. We rule you or we kill you. Yeah? So there is no choice. Either we rule you or we kill you. This is what happened after 3rd of July. But is Egypt not ready for democracy? I don't think that there is that there are ready, people who are ready for democracy or people who are not ready. Democracy is good for all people and is an option. But even for you in Italy, if you have a security problem, it will be number two after security. And you will go for those who will secure you first. Imagine if you every day go to the streets and you hear that people were slaughtered, children were thrown from a high building. You must have seen some photos of people were thrown from the seventh floor, yeah? So the whole thing is to be, to put yourself uh, down to earth and say, if I'm an Egyptian today, what are my priorities? I believe that 90% of the Egyptians would agree with me. Security, 
let the economy, economic wheel move. We, we, we used to have 15 million tourists a year. Yeah? Who will come today to a place where people could be killed or raped? Of course, raped has a cushion mark. <laughs> but uh, uh, I believe that the priorities are as such. Security, eating, and then democracy. So I refuse the question, Egypt was not ready for. No, Egypt was, in my views, rescued from a, da a sharp turn to the Middle Ages. Egypt has been rescued. But the challenge today is to have a secured country and to have the economic wheels moving. But if you tell people today that your first option is democracy, I'm sure many Egyptians will say to you, not necessarily now, maybe after two years. But today, we need our people, when they go to the street, they come back home. So I hope I answered your questions. I hope you found the session moving. And I thank you for being here. Thank you very much. Thank you. I want to thank uh, our experts, uh, Tarek Heggy and uh, Valentina Colombo. Uh, I am really grateful, and the uh, Yenaya Enrico Matte Foundation is a really, really grateful and uh, honored uh, to have uh, such a, uh, uh, an international expert about Islamic world here. I uh, introduced uh, this lecture uh, using English. I would like to conclude, in just one minute, obviously, it's late, uh, using Italian, uh, if you agree. The language is not <laughs> Volevo ringraziarvi tutti e darvi, innanzitutto, dire che so che siamo andati in ritardo, ma non ho voluto intervenire appositamente perché ho visto delle facce sveglie e estremamente attente a tutto ciò che i nostri relatori dicevano. State due ore e mezza, a mio avviso, di un grande investimento, soprattutto per i giovani, che magari per la prima volta affrontano, come sottoscritto, non che sia giovane, ma per la prima volta affronto questo argomento, eh, così in dettaglio, così in profondità e soprattutto eh, avendo dei, degli esperti di così elevato livello di fronte a me. Penso sia stato un ottimo investimento mh, per due motivi. Sia perché stiamo parlando di paesi che ci sono vicini, per gran parte delle regioni d'Italia l'Egitto, da un punto di vista della distanza fisica, è molto più vicino dell'Austria piuttosto che della Francia. Quindi, a mio avviso, dovremmo essere interessati a quello che accada in quei paesi, ma anche cercare di capire quello che potrà essere un'evoluzione e magari anche cercare di favorire un'evoluzione che possa essere democratica nel rispetto, ovviamente, dell'identità culturale del singolo paese. Il secondo motivo per cui penso sia stato un investimento è proprio perché eh, cercare di capire eh, mentalità di tipo diverso, culture di tipo diverso, eh, paesi di tipo diverso, eh, aiuta, ad essere, aiuta ad essere quei famosi cittadini del mondo eh, di cui si diceva prima. La speranza di tutti è ovviamente che si possa evolvere verso una società che pur, ripeto, nella, eh, mantenendo delle identità culturali forti che connotano ciascuna popolazione, eh, abbiano o giungano a rispettare un, eh, un nucleo di valori comuni sulla base del quale costituire proprio questa cittadinanza internazionale. Quando noi potremo andare in un altro paese e vedere rispettati questi, questo nucleo fondamentale di valori comuni che sono valori della persona, vederli rispettati in quel paese, allora potremmo essere, potremmo dirci veramente, cittadini del mondo. Due, no, due notizie di servizio, due comunicazioni di servizio. La prima è che a questa lettura seguirà un, ehm, una pubblicazione, eh, stiamo... Eh, lavorando per pubblicare i contenuti delle nostre lecture. Eh, chi è interessato la potrà scaricare in PDF dal nostro sito web oppure potrà farne richiesta del volumetto scritto presso la Fondazione. Se vi piace di più la carta, siete ancora dell'era analogica come sottoscritto. La seconda informazione è che abbiamo finito e che di, nella stanza di fronte a noi c'è un buffet eh, per voi e quindi potete andare e avere il meritato 
pranzo dopo due ore e mezza di grande interesse. Grazie a tutti. Thank you to you, Tara. It was you a pleasure really to see you again. Thank you very really much. Really interesting. Thank you very really, much. Really interesting. Uh, I was, uh, I'm, I'm happy that there is a proposal that...